Welcome everyone, and a special welcome to those who are new to the George Craw Lecture Series, which is now in its fifth season. Thank you, George, for your generosity. We are lucky to have you as an alumnus, Cal College Class of 1971, which is celebrating 50 years this spring. George, incidentally, is leading up that an anniversary event, and I'm delighted to have the support of both George and his wife, Rafe. Thank you. This series was born out of George's belief that UC Santa Cruz has so much incredible cutting edge research and scholarship worth highlighting. Tonight's lecture has so much to offer with Carol Greider, a great example. Carol was the recipient of the 2009 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, and she has joined our faculty this fall. We're thrilled to have Carol with us at UC Santa Cruz on so many levels. First, she's an incredible scientist. Her research focuses on the ends of chromosomes called telomeres and the enzymes that maintain them. You'll hear more about that tonight, but understanding this fundamental mechanism of maintaining our DNA gives us insight into age-related degenerative diseases and how we might fight them. She's a fantastic addition to our molecular cell and developmental biology team. Even though UC Santa Cruz doesn't have a medical school, we are contributing in large ways to the fight against cancer and disease. And Carol's work is at the forefront of that fight. Carol is also a fierce advocate for the importance of women and minorities in science, a cause I also care deeply about. It's fitting that she won her Nobel in 2009, a year in which five women received Nobel Prizes. Since Marie Curie's 1911 prize, there have been 347 Nobel Prizes given in physiology or medicine and chemistry, the fields in which biologists are recognized. Only 14 of those prizes, just 4%, have gone to women. But things are changing, and at the University of California is part of that change. A number of female winners were announced this year, including two from the UC system. UC Berkeley biochemist Jennifer Doudna received the prize in chemistry, and UCLA astronomer Andrea Getz in physics. So I'm proud that the University of California continues to be at the forefront of research development. Here on our campus, Carol is continuing to push the bounds of knowledge in her field and is working with both undergraduate and graduate students at UC Santa Cruz and remains a strong voice for change and for diversifying the sciences. She served on a working group for the director of the National Institutes of Health on changing culture to end sexual harassment. And she's first author with other scientific leaders of a high visibility 2019 policy paper in the journal Science on increasing gender diversity in the STEM research workforce. This is critical as the case for more and diverse perspectives is a strong one. The diversity of our students at UC Santa Cruz means that we are training researchers who will bring new questions and skills, fresh ideas and unique perspectives to their fields, leading to innovative approaches and new solutions. And now more than ever, we need to develop an informed, scientifically literate citizenry and people of different backgrounds seeing themselves reflected in scientists and researchers can usher in that literacy. Moderating tonight's discussion is Nidhi Bala, a UCSC professor of molecular cell and developmental biology. The Bala lab investigates how chromosomes monitor themselves throughout the complex choreography of cell division. Dr. Bala received her bachelor's degree from Columbia College, her doctorate from UC San Francisco, and did a postdoctoral research internship at UC Berkeley. She's a perfect choice to moderate tonight's questions. So Needy, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Chancellor. Um, before we begin, I'd like to share a few details about the event tonight. We are using a webinar tool so that there is no chat, there's no chat function. We will have an opportunity to answer your questions at the end of the program. So we invite you to submit your questions into the Q&A box at any time. And tonight's event will be recorded. So it is my deep, deep honor to introduce Carolyn Greider. Carol Greider is an American molecular biologist and Nobel laureate. 
She joined UC Santa Cruz in October 2020 as a distinguished professor of molecular cell and developmental biology. Carol discovered the enzyme telomerase in 1984 while she was a graduate student of Liz Blackburn at the University of California, Berkeley. Carol pioneered research on the structure of telomeres, the ends of chromosomes. And she was awarded the 2009 Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine along with Liz Blackburn and Jack Shostak for their discovery that telomeres are protected from progressive shortening by the enzyme telomerase. Before joining UC Santa Cruz, she was a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor, Daniel Nathan's Professor, and a Director of Molecular Biology and Genetics at Johns Hopkins University. And we are very lucky and very glad that she has joined the faculty at UC Santa Cruz Molecular Cell and Developmental Biology. Thank you, Nidhi. That was a wonderful introduction. And thank you to the Chancellor for um, uh, also introducing me. And I will go ahead and um, share my screen. Um, Nidhi, can you tell me, are, am, are you seeing the correct version? Yes. Great. All right, so it's really um, wonderful to be here with you all virtually. Um, of course, this is a virtual um, cron lecture, which is um, nice in the sense that a lot of us can be together, um, but we are in the pandemic. And so um, I did name this the pandemic Zoom lecture. And what I'd like to do tonight is to um, take you through um, some of the uh, ideas and discovery about uh, telomeres and telomerase, and then give you an idea about um, the direction um, that we're going in as we uh, now embark on our new phase here at UCSC. So I'm going to start off just by um, starting with some of the basics about what telomeres are about and what chromosomes are about. And then I'll um, unfold a little bit of a story um, over the last um, really 30 years that has unfolded. Sorry for the delay. Um, so we're starting from the beginning here um, and um, inside the cell, we have the cell nucleus and within every nucleus, um, there are chromosomes and the chromosomes are made up of DNA. And most of what happens along the length of the chromosome is that um, there is this code. You see these um, nucleotides, A, G, T, C, G, C, A, that encode for all of the blueprint of what goes on inside the cell. And so um, this is the DNA sequence uh, that is on most of the chromosomes. But what we're going to be talking about today is something a little bit different, which is the DNA sequence, which is at the very ends of the chromosomes. And so telomeres are what's at the very end of the chromosome. And the word telomere comes from the Greek uh, telo, meaning end, and mere part. So it's the end part of the chromosome. So if you were to look within the cell, um, in the nucleus, you have this chromosome. And what most of molecular biology is focused on is these genes and the regulatory elements along the length of the chromosome. But today, what we're going to be doing is representing that by basically a black box because we're not going to be focused on the DNA and the regulation along the length of the chromosome. Instead, we're going to be focused here on the telomere, um, which is a unique part of the end of the chromosome. And the telomeres have two really critical functions. First, they have to protect the DNA ends. And second, they have to allow maintenance of telomere length. And that's what we'll be exploring today is this maintenance um, of telomere length. So the telomere function was defined in 1943 by Barbara McClintock, who was working in um, maize, the corn plant. Um, and what she determined was that the ends of chromosomes have a very unique function. And that function is very specifically to protect the chromosome end um, from any kind of a um, uh, attack or, um, or, or recombination. The sequence 
that was at the ends of the chromosomes, this DNA sequence, was initially identified um, as tandem repeats of a very simple sequence. Rather than coding for something, it's just this tandem repeat, TT, G, 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 TT, G, 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 TT, G, 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 which does not encode for anything like the rest of the chromosome does. Instead, it provides a protective cap. And this sequence was identified in this really unusual organism, uh, Tetrahymena thermophila. It's a single-celled pond animal. If you go out to some pond somewhere uh, nearby, you could probably scoop up some tetrahymena or some paramecium, it's, it's cousin. And the reason that we were able to identify the sequence in tetrahymena is that a single cell contains 40,000 chromosomes. So this is what um, is really important in science. If you want to ask a very specific question, what is happening at the ends of chromosomes? You choose an organism that has a lot of those things. And so the chromosomes, 40,000 of them, allowed Liz Blackburn and Joe Gall in 1978 to determine that the sequence was this very repetitive uh, TT, G, 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 at the ends of the chromosomes. So we know if we represent the chromosome here as this black box, and here are the telomere repeats, those TT, G, 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 G repeats, that there are the many repeats. And what these do is to um, protect the chromosome end. And this chromosome is not drawn to scale. Um, of course, the telomeres are just a small part um, of the chromosome. Um, but what I want to illustrate here is that the way that cells normally copy their DNA, they don't copy the DNA to the very end. And this has to do with the molecular mechanism of how chromosomes are copied. But it's really quite remarkable that with every cell division, so when you have a chromosome and then you go through cell division, there's a few repeats that are lost from the end of the chromosome during that division. And so with many divisions, there is a progressive loss of these telomere repeats from the ends of chromosomes. So this was a puzzle um, back in the 1980s. And um, we were very curious when uh, I was working with uh, Liz Blackburn. Um, you can imagine that if telomere repeats are always lost from the ends of the chromosomes, how could we all still be here if we're losing DNA from the ends of our chromosomes? And so by following our curiosity, we then set out to ask the question, how could it be that these uh, telomeres could be maintained over time? And what we discovered was that although there's telomere shortening due to uh, repeated cell divisions, uh, there's this uh, enzyme, which is a little machine inside the cell that we call telomerase. Um, and what telomerase does is to add the telomere repeats back onto the chromosomes. So here's the little machine. This is the telomerase enzyme, and it's adding these repeats back onto the ends of chromosomes. So rather than solving the problem of the chromosomes shortening every time the cells divide, it basically compensates for that problem. So there's some shortening and some lengthening and some shortening and some lengthening. So we were very interested to really understand um, what this telomerase enzyme um, is doing. Um, and we spent some time uh, looking at the, um, the detailed mechanism of how this works. Uh, but then we also got very curious as to um, what happens when it doesn't work. So that led us to the question, why does telomerase matter? And I'll give you the spoiler alert. And the answer is that it's required for all cells that have to divide many times. And this plays out in two really critical roles um, in human disease. First of all, we have normal tissue renewal. For instance, you can imagine your skin cells. Um, the skin cells have to divide a little bit to be able to maintain because some skin cells uh, slough off. And so the normal tissue renewal 
you have a cell that has to self renew like this arrow is, but that cell also gives rise to um, specialized cells every time it divides and more specialized cells. And it turns out that you have to have telomerase to be able to maintain the um, growth of these cells. A second area where telomerase is really essential um, is in cancer. Again, you have a, um, a stem cell in the, uh, in the tissue that has to self renew and give rise to specific other progeny, but you may have a specific change that occurs um, called a mutation. And that mutation can lead the cells to then be able to divide many more times than they have to. And this can give rise to tumor cells. And in order for that to happen, those cells have to divide. And so these cells require telomerase. So we were very curious about um, how telomerase um, would be required in cells. And so um, we set out to use um, specific mouse models. So mice can help us understand telomere function. What we wanted to ask was, what happens if telomeres can't be elongated? So we set out to devise a way to have a mouse where we could test this mouse that lacks telomerase enzyme activity and ask, what happens if you can't elongate telomeres? So what we found is that um, progressive telomere shortening occurs in mice that lack telomerase. So what's illustrated here is a mouse that we generated that has no telomerase and we would cross two such mice together. And we call these G1 for the first generation, the first generation of the telomerase mouse that lacks telomerase. And then when we cross these two together, we get the second generation mouse, the G2. Um, and it has uh, telomeres that are, are still reasonably long. We now take this G2 mouse, two G2 mice cross them to each other, and we generate a, a G3, third generation mouse. And you can see that the telomeres now have shortened um, because they lack the ability to elongate the telomeres because they don't have this telomerase enzyme. And then when we take the G3 and cross them to each other, we get a G4 mouse. And again, the telomeres are um, shorter in that generation. And what we found from studying these mice um, and um, Sorry, the way that we, uh, that we studied these mice is to um, actually look at the chromosomes. And that's one thing that's um, very nice uh, to be able to actually visualize the chromosomes themselves. So this is an example of mouse chromosomes. Um, and you can see what we've done here is to um, be able to visualize the telomere at the end of the chromosome here uh, and the telomeres here. And um, the intensity of this signal is proportional to the length of the telomere. So you can see that there are um, telomeres that are short here and other telomeres that have a much larger signal here. And this is because there's some shortening and some lengthening and some shortening and lengthening and different telomeres have different lengths. And so what we find is that there's this equilibrium of telomere length. So in the early generation mice that have no telomerase, we have this distribution of signal intensity um, across all of those telomeres. And then when we look in the later generation mice, the sixth generation telomerase null mice, we find that there are um, significantly shorter telomeres that this distribution has moved to lower signal intensities and what we and many others in the field have shown is that there's a threshold. When the telomeres get to be too short, these very short telomeres do not allow the cells to continue to divide. They signal a DNA damage response that halts cell division. So what we've found then is that telomere shortening leads to either cell death or cell senescence. That is, the cells are unable to divide continuously. So with each round of cell division, we're losing some of these telomere repeats 
from the end of the chromosome. And then when the chromosomes get to a threshold that is too short, they then signal cell death or cellular senescence. So this is what we found by just following our curiosity to try and understand what happens when cells don't have telomerase to be able to get at the question of what does telomerase normally do? So this gets back to the same question that I was uh, discussing before, and that is telomerase is required for cells that have to divide many times. And we focused initially on this question of what happens in cancer, because in cancer, um, you have to self-renew, but then if you have a change that those cells undergo, um, those tumor cells have to divide many more times than uh, they normally would. And we and others had shown um, over 20 or more years ago um, that telomerase is activated in cancer cells. Telomerase is not active in most cells. It is active in some stem cells required for self-renewal, and we'll talk about that again um, in a few minutes. But people have found that 90% of human cancers have activated telomerase. Other cancers, the other 10%, use a different method to elongate telomeres, and I'm happy to answer questions later about that um, alternative method. But what that means is that maintaining telomeres is essential for all cancer cell growth. So we wanted to investigate this using these um, telomerase null mice to ask what happens in cancer if there's no telomerase to be able to allow uh, that cancer cell division. And so what we did was find a way to um, examine uh, telomeres in the situation of cancer. And we found that short telomeres actually block tumor cell growth. We took a mouse, which is a tumor prone mouse that has um, a tumor called a B cell lymphoma. And we crossed this to a telomerase deficient mouse so that we can generate mice that have no telomerase, but normally would develop a tumor. And of course we have the G1 telomerase null mouse that has long telomeres. And then we bred this, so we generate the G2, the G3, et cetera, all the way through G6, as I had previously shown, that the telomeres shorten progressively with each generation um, of these mice. And what we found is that the short telomeres um, protect the cells against B-cell lymphoma. So what's shown here is a Kaplan-Meier survival curve. So the percent of mice alive is shown on this axis, and the number of days is shown on this axis. And if we focus here on this black curve, these are the tumor-prone mice that have telomerase, the normal tumor-prone mice. And you can see that you start off with 100% of the mice are alive, but over time, following this black curve here, after a little over 200 days, almost all of the mice have died of this B cell lymphoma. If we now look at the tumor prone mice that lack telomerase, but still have long telomeres because it's just the first generation. In this blue line here, we see that there's a very similar um, survival curve. These mice are getting this cancer and are dying of the cancer. Quite strikingly, the tumor prone mice that had very short telomeres, that's the sixth generation mice, had a much uh, better survival. That is, most of the mice survived. And this was, was quite striking. And you see these little tick marks here in this, uh, in this graph. And that's where the, uh, my student, uh, David Felzer, would go and look at these mice. And what he found was that there were very, very small tumors. So the tumor still started, but it couldn't grow. It couldn't grow 
because it didn't have telomerase to be able to allow those many cell divisions. So that's the conclusion that short telomeres block the growth of the tumor, not the start of the tumor. So if we can think of tumor progression where you have a normal cell and that undergoes um, specific genetic changes and then becomes a, a precancerous cell, the short telomeres actually block this step from that going on and being able to form um, the cancer that will allow cells to continue to grow. Now, we and others have been very interested in this for a number of years uh, in trying to understand how this might play a role in, um, in uh, the treatment of cancer and could you target uh, shortening of telomeres as a way for cancer treatment. And I think that that's still a very interesting question, but in the um, intervening years, there's been a, a additional information that we know now about uh, the normal role of telomeres. So we have to understand uh, this uh, role of, uh, of telomerase in cancer together with the normal role that telomerase plays um, in regular cells. So we were discussing this issue of cancer and telomerase being essential for cells that have to divide many times. Now we'll focus here on the issue of um, normal tissue renewal because cells that have to divide um, throughout the body for um, normal regeneration also require telomerase. So um, I was surprised when I was uh, looking at this slide that it was 30 years ago now that we um, did an experiment um, where we showed that telomere shortening happens in normal human cells. Uh, so this is a publication. Um, the title is Telomere Shortened During Aging of Human Fibroblasts. Human fibroblasts are basically skin cells. And so what is shown here is an experiment where we look at telomere length on this axis and the number of cell divisions that those um, skin cells underwent in, in a culture. And if we just focus on um, one of the experimental um, points, um, you can see that there's a progressive shortening of telomeres in this particular um, set of cells over time. And if we look at another set of cells, there's also telomere shortening over time. So this showed that in human skin cells, when they are cultured, that the telomere shorten progressively. Five years later, we were able to show when you take blood cells and now look at telomere length versus the age of the person who those blood cells were collected from, the donor age, there's also a progressive shortening of telomeres um, of the blood cells with increased age of the individuals. We didn't really know what this meant at the time, and we're still really trying to understand this. Um, but our um, current understanding is that um, these cells have not quite enough telomerase. So every time the cells divide, there's a little bit of shortening over time. And we'll get back to this shortening um, of blood cells um, in just a minute. While we were doing these experiments, a very interesting um, paper was published uh, by a collaboration from Monica Bessler, Phil Mason, and Energy Dokal. And what they found was that um, telomerase deficiency causes bone marrow failure. The title of this paper, uh, the RNA component of telomerase is mutated in autosomal dominant dyskeratosis. Um, the RNA component of telomerase is one of those uh, telomerase components and autosomal dominant dyskeratosis congenita causes an inherited bone marrow failure syndrome. And we were um, quite uh, interested in this paper when it was published um, because we wanted to understand um, how we could use our um, genetic tools and, and use our mouse genetics to understand about this bone marrow failure uh, syndrome. So we went back to the drawing board and we identified a strain of mice that had telomere length similar to humans. 
What I haven't um, told you at the outset is that the, the mice that we were originally studying is this mouse called Mus musculus musculus. And these are called laboratory mice. And these mice have telomeres that are about 10 times longer than normal human telomeres. And so what we decided to do to try and understand what happens in human disease is to look at a different mouse, the mouse called Mus musculus constanius, and this is a wild derived mouse. But the advantage is that these Mus castaneus mice have telomeres that are the same length as human telomeres. So we can make the comparison to human disease much more readily um, by studying these mice. And what we found was that the short telomeres cause a loss of tissue renewal capacity. When we breed these mice for increasing generations as we had the previous mice, but now these mice have the same length telomeres as humans, what we found was that in the blood, we saw this bone marrow failure syndrome. In the intestine, we found that there's a loss of the lining of the intestine, which normally has to self-renew um, repeatedly um, over time. In the skin, there was a decreased ability for wound healing. Again, you need stem cells to be able to continue to divide to be able to do wound healing. And in the hair, there was premature graying. And um, in the testes, we saw cell death that led to infertility. So this set up our um, understanding of what happens when you have telomere length similar to human telomere length, and you're, you're looking at the, the, the whole organism. And while we were doing these experiments, um, there was a, a very interesting uh, clinical connection um, Rob Brodsky, who was um, in the hematology clinic at, um, at Hopkins, called me up one day um, and said that they had um, a patient uh, who had come in uh, that seemed to have uh, a telomere problem. And what we found was that inherited mutations in telomerase cause these telomere syndromes that mimic age-related disease. So let me just set up this um, experiment right here. Um, many of you may recognize this as a family tree. Um, and so we have um, a grandmother here and a grandfather. And then we have um, their children uh, shown here on this line, just like you would find any uh, genealogy uh, tree. And um, this uh, father here and um, the mother here uh, gave rise to this individual who came into the clinic um, at Johns Hopkins because he had a bone marrow failure syndrome. And um, what's shown here in this family tree is what uh, Mary Armanios, who um, is a colleague of mine that I'm continuing to collaborate with um, at Johns Hopkins, um, was able to um, understand about their, the genetics in this family. And so um, those individuals that are shown here um, with a black coloring, actually have um, insufficient telomerase. They actually have a mutation in the telomerase gene. And um, this uh, individual um, here had this bone marrow failure syndrome. And by continuing to study many such families that have now come into the Hopkins Clinic um, that Mary Armanios has set up, what Mary has been able to show is that there is this bone marrow failure that occurs in people that have insufficient telomerase. There's also something called pulmonary fibrosis, which is um, a lung disease um, that typically comes on um, in the uh, 70s and 80s. Immunosenescence, that is not enough immune function, a predisposition to emphysema, uh, intolerance to chemotherapy, a form of liver cirrhosis, as well as um, problems with the gastrointestinal system. All of these are um, examples of um, diseases where um, when the telomeres get short, you have a um, loss of renewal capacity. And one of the really interesting things about these families is that there's progressive disease with each generation. So uh, 
This individual came into the clinic in his teens. His father died of the disease in his 50s, and his grandmother died of a related disease in her 60s. And so what we and others have found is that there is a progressive change from one generation to the next to the next with a worsening of symptoms and an earlier age of onset of those symptoms. So this is the progressive disease in these families. And this might remind you of the telomerase knockout mouse, where for the first generations, we didn't see any effect. Second generations, we didn't see any effect. It was only in the later generations. So there's a progressive um, worsening of these symptoms. So if we're going to understand um, these patients and the age-related degenerative disease that they present, we have to be able to accurately um, measure telomere length from these people when they come into the clinic. And so we adapted an assay, um, a way to, um, to study telomere length uh, that was first pioneered by Peter Landstorp um, at the Terry Fox Center. And um, it's uh, called Flowfish for the aficionados. And with this very accurate way of measuring telomere length, we can look at um, the normal distribution of telomere length in the human population. So what's shown here is telomere length versus the age of the individuals. So you can see here um, at age zero, which is basically from uh, cord blood, which comes from, um, from birth, that there is a normal distribution the normal population has a um, either nine to 13 uh, kilobase length telomeres. And then this distribution continues to shorten over time, but there is a, a variety of the distribution of these um, normal individuals. So in order to determine whether um, somebody may be at risk for a telomere mediated disease, we needed to put um, very specific confidence intervals on this population. And so using uh, statistics, we can determine this cutoff length for the 99th percentile of the longest telomeres in the population. And then we can determine where the 50th percentile is. So the average person would have telomere length around this length and the first percentile for the lowest telomere length. And using these uh, confidence intervals, we can then uh, examine people's telomere lengths and determine whether or not they may be at risk for this age-related degenerative disease. And what Mary has found uh, when doing that um, is that uh, people um, with defects in telomerase and telomere genes have shorter telomere risk have shorter telomeres and are at risk for disease. So what's shown here in black are uh, individuals in families that have um, normal telomerase components. They are not carriers of the mutation. While those shown here in red, you see fall mostly below the first percentile. And so those are the individuals with the short telomeres who are at risk for disease. So using this, we can then uh, try and understand from the human population study, what is happening in these families um, over time as the telomeres are shortening. So I've told you two different stories. I've told you about the consequences for telomeres that are both too short and too long. So we talked about these inherited diseases of telomere shortening that lead to um, age-related degenerative disease and stem cell failure if telomeres are too short. On the other hand, if telomeres are constantly maintained um, and are maintained at a long length, then there's a predisposition to cancer. So this really puts us in the position of really trying to understand um, if one wanted to intervene in either the stem cell failure 
for the cancer, you have to think very critically about each individual patient and what their telomere length is to determine whether or not if you were to shorten telomeres uh, to treat cancer, whether they would then be at risk for these stem cell failure diseases. Or alternatively, if you wanted to find a way to elongate telomeres to treat these degenerative diseases, whether you might predispose to cancer. So um, we are at a, um, a very uh, critical point where we can now measure these telomere lengths in these individuals. Um, and we can then um, uh, go forward to think about the kinds of um, mechanistic interventions that we might want to make. So one of the things that we really want to um, understand is the details of how the telomere length is established. Because if you want to tip the balance of those two uh, aspects, you have to understand how the system functions normally. So if we imagine that we have telomeric DNA and we have this telomerase enzyme that I introduced at the beginning, which will add repeats onto the ends of the chromosome, we need to understand in detail the molecular mechanism of how it establishes the length of the telomere before we can really understand how to intervene uh, to treat disease. Um, and this is uh, one of the aspects that we're going to be very focused on in my lab here um, at UCSC is dissecting um, what it is uh, that regulates this uh, addition of telomeres onto the ends of chromosomes. So that brings me now to my um, take home message number one. And so the first thing is to say, if you see a slide that says take home message number one, it probably means there'll be a take home message number two. Um, so my take home message number one is curiosity driven research provides unexpected discoveries that give insight into biology. So we didn't set out at the beginning to understand how telomere length played a role in bone marrow failure or pulmonary fibrosis. We set out to just ask what happens when telomeres aren't maintained and by Following our curiosity, we were able to follow up and understand um, these aspects um, of human disease. So the other thing that people may be um, thinking about when they've heard about telomeres, as you may have seen um, in the um, uh, news media over the last 10 years, um, about telomeres and aging. So I've been very careful to say uh, that telomeres play a role in age-related disease, which they clearly do. Um, but the, the media picks this up um, and it becomes a complicated story, telomeres and aging. So here's something um, from the internet. The secret to aging, to graceful aging, treat your telomeres with love. Um, and here's another um, thing that you can find um, out there on the web. It's a complicated story. It says researchers may have finally cracked the code to aging, the length and health of our telomeres, which are tiny but extraordinarily important pieces of genetic code stored deep within our cells. And I'm not sure what's going on with her and her cells here. It looks a little um, see-through to me. What has uh, happened over the past um, 10 years or so is that there are companies now that will um, measure your telomere length for you and um, tell you that if you can measure your telomere length, then you can stay younger longer. Um, here's another example. Um, you can send them some blood. They will tell you your telomere length. And supposedly that will then help you um, live a healthier life. Be skeptical because what a lot of these companies um, are doing is to um, interpret the normal distribution of telomere length in the population um, in a very um, obscure way. So for example, deviation from the 50th percentile does not mean your telomeres are not normal. So um, let's just look at this graph here. I showed you these data points before. These are all normal people across here. And this red line is meant to be the 50th percentile in the population. If we take um, an individual, let's say here, who's 25 years old, 
and has telomeres that are normal for the population. They will measure your telomere length and then draw a line and say that your telomere lengths are actually the telomere lengths of a 50 year old. Um, and they will tell you that you will have a problem with age related degenerative disease. But that is an incorrect interpretation because uh, this normal distribution is uh, not, um, it's, it's a normal distribution, you have normal telomere lengths. Um, and, and these kinds of um, uh, information that people have about their telomere length when it's put out there into the media um, have, have very important consequences for um, people's own uh, personal health. So in addition to direct to consumer telomere length testing, um, there's also um, the, the issue of nutraceuticals. Um, let me first say, um, that the, the, the point about the telomere length that I was making with the telomerase knockout mouse is that telomeres provide a buffer zone and there's no consequence until the buffer is lost. So if you have a telomere that is 10 units long, you're healthy. If you're nine units long, you're healthy. If you're eight units long, you're healthy. If you're seven units, all of these telomeres are healthy. And what those direct to consumer telomere tests are saying is that they're saying that if your telomeres are this long versus this long, then you will have health implications. And we don't have any information um, that there is any consequence until you have very short telomeres. So then there's also the um, question about nutraceuticals. You can read a lot of things um, and uh, go to uh, various um, nutraceutical sites and they will sell you uh, telomere cream or um, telomere support or cracking aging and all of these telomax are purported to tell you that um, you can take these things and avoid um, any of the consequence of aging. And here's one that I found today, which was um, uh, quite interesting. Uh, this one, you don't actually have to ingest anything. This one just says the information embedded in this audio will work to stimulate telomerase production, which will in turn help the degradation of telomere caps and result in slower aging. So all you need to do is click here, buy this product, spend your $80 and your telomerase will be stimulated. So take home message number two, don't believe everything you read. Um, Telomeres are important in age-related disease, but there are a lot of people out there that will want to sell you things that you need to be very skeptical of. So let me just summarize. I've told you that telomeres are required for chromosome protection. Telomerase is essential for telomere maintenance. Telomere shortening leads to cell death after many cell divisions. Short telomeres limit the growth of cancer cells. Short telomeres limit tissue renewal and contribute to age-related degenerative disease. And then the last thing is beware of simple cures for aging, be skeptical. So I just wanted to um, give thanks to um, all of the people that I've um, worked with um, over the years. Science is really a team effort. Um, I've talked about um, a lot of experiments that were done um, as a collaborative effort. Uh, first, I wanted to show this slide of um, my lab in 2017 when we went to the March for Science um, in Washington and had all of our various signs. And then to point out um, our collaborators, uh, Mary Armanios, who's uh, at the um, Telomere Center and Johns Hopkins. She's a professor of oncology. Uh, John Alder um, is another collaborator at the University of Pittsburgh and Sarah Whelan and Mackenzie Garrison um, at Johns Hopkins. And so the Grider Lab is moving slowly west. Uh, this is what we call Grider Lab East. Uh, this was my, my lab um, about um, a year ago. And um, now we have uh, new members here at UCSC. We have Mayang, Akshi, uh, Taya, um, and um, me in my native environment. Um, so um, I will go ahead and stop there and um, we can take questions. <laughs>
Great, Carol, thank you so much for that talk. Um, so I'm gonna just give you a couple of questions from the, the Q&A. So there's a question from Alexis. How do telomeres relate to hereditary cancer conditions that cause DNA mismatch repair problems, such as Lynch syndrome? Um, so there are hereditary syndromes uh, that are involved um, with telomeres. Um, I don't know of any connection specifically to Lynch syndrome, um, but there are, um, just as there are families that have not enough telomerase and they have these age-related degenerative diseases, there are also families that have mutations that cause longer telomeres. And those families are cancer prone. And um, interestingly, um, uh, glioblastoma and melanoma are two of the uh, main cancers uh, which um, appear uh, when individuals have uh, what we would call long telomeres. So there is the other side, also genetic um, inheritance of, of cancer predisposition. Thank you. Um, and then from James, can you discuss the implications of how hyperbaric oxygen therapy increases the length of telomeres? Is this an anti-aging therapy? Um, I am not aware of uh, studies about um, hyperbaric uh, oxygen therapy and telomeres. Um, I, I would need to, to look at those studies to be able to comment on them. Thank you. Um, and from Marasano, why, why do organisms not have circular chromosomes? Is that because generally you don't want, you want cells to um, make this decision between continuing to divide and not dividing or to die? Um, so there are cells that have circular chromosomes. In fact, bacteria have circular chromosomes. And so they completely avoid this problem um, altogether. Um, but I think that the, uh, the best answer to this question that, um, that I have come across, and actually Unity would know more about this than I do, is um, uh, the um, evolution, evolution of um, sexual reproduction, where you have um, inheritance of chromosomes from mom and inheritance of chromosomes from dad, um, and this process by which you have to um, uh, reduce the number of chromosomes called meiosis, which is what Needy works on. Um, and in order to um, have that kind of exchange of genetic information by having chromosomes from mom and chromosomes from dad, it doesn't work to have circular chromosomes because the circular chromosomes would not separate properly. Um, this is the best, best ex explanation that, um, that I've come uh, across for why chromosomes evolved to be linear. Thank you. And um, thank you for the shout out. Um, from Suzanne, for several years, I've been fascinated by the ACE or the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study from Kaiser that highlights the detrimental effects of an unstable childhood on telomeres, but that this damage can actually be reversed through good nutrition or healthier lifestyle. Is this information that your team is also working with? And what lessons can we take away from this as far as how we can keep ourselves as healthy as possible? Yeah, and I anticipate there are a number of questions um, about these kinds of studies where people um, have found um, that there are certain um, adverse uh, events, um, stress and other um, uh, effects that would shorten telomeres and then what would happen to lengthen them. Um, and really this, this has to do with that um, normal distribution um, of telomere length that I was talking about. All of these effects are within that normal distribution. So um, it's not clear that um, um, there is a biological effect because the changes are relatively small and, and they don't actually affect telomere biology. Um, so the, the, um, these, these studies um, are, are of interest. Um, and then there are also studies that suggest that um, Eating well, exercising will lengthen your telomeres. Um, again, those are all within the normal realm. They're not within the biologically, um, uh, would, there, would there be any biological effect on the telomeres? So it's, it's great to be able to um, tell people that they should exercise, get lots of sleep, eat well, have good nutrition, all of those things are great. So um, whether or not they actually change your telomeres, I think we actually don't know the answer to that. Um, 
Okay, thank you. And then Larry asks, can radiation, for example, microwave or NMR imaging or CT scans affect telomeres or their related enzymes? Um, I don't know of any studies that have said anything about um, radiation and telomeres. Um, and then Kevin wants to know what units are being used to measure telomere length. So in some of your graphs about normal distribution, what are the units there? So typically the way we measure lengths um, in, in DNA, I showed at the very beginning, I showed um, some base pairs. So I showed A pairs with T and G pairs with C. And so then that makes a length. Um, and so we count um, DNA length in base pairs. Uh, so that was the length on the, the units that I was showing. And so typically we'll use that as a kilobase pair, so a thousand base pairs. But what we're counting is how many of those nucleotides, how long the DNA actually is. Okay. And then Kathleen asks, where is telomerase made in this cell and what are its precursors? Um, so telomerase is made up of several different components. Um, it has a um, catalytic protein component, and it also has an essential catalytic RNA component. So there are two essential components, and um, they are both made in, um, in the nucleus, and then they come together and they act on the telomeres that are in the nucleus. Okay. And Richard asks, what's the optimum telomere length for health? Is there one? That's a really interesting question, um, because as I pointed out, telomeres are too short, you're predisposed to age-related degenerative disease. And if they're too long, there's a predisposition to cancer. So um, somewhere that, that normal distribution that I was showing, you don't have to be exactly on the line of the 50th percentile in the population, um, but somewhere around that line um, would be um, a, a healthy place to be where most people are. That's how that data was generated by taking healthy people and determining what their telomere length is. Um, and then Julius asks, have you found a pattern, whether or not it's related to telomeres or not, where a genetically inherited disease actually skips a generation? And so it's, for example, it shows up in the grandparents, skips the parents, and then shows up in the grandchildren. Um, well, this is challenging my um, human genetics. Um, <laughs> that's not the case in this, um, uh, in the telomere mediated disease. In the telomere mediated diseases, it's a progressive uh, decline um, with each generation. But I do think that there are some inherited genetic um, traits that skip generations. And I, I don't know enough about that to be able to comment, but that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, so Richard asks, can telomerase enzyme be added to people suffering from low telomerase? And can this addition actually be limited to certain organs so that you're, you're affecting the organs that might be specifically affected? Right, so this gets at the question of what kind of treatment one would want to have. And um, right now we don't have a way to um, add telomerase back to specific organs. This is why we really want to understand the specific um, mechanistic uh, pathway by which telomerase elongates telomeres because we would like to be able to intervene in that and have the telomeres get maybe just a little bit longer. But the problem is if they get too much longer, then you could potentially predispose to cancer. So this is why it's really important to be able to measure people's telomere length and know if, for instance, you have already very long telomeres. And if you have a, um, a particular cancer, you would be less likely to have a problem if you had a short-term inhibition of telomerase to treat the cancer. Um, however, if you started off with very short telomeres, you might not want to give a telomerase inhibitor to a person that already has very short telomeres because you might tip them over the edge into the age-related disease. So this is that balance that I was talking about. And so um, it's very important to um, think about intervening. And we don't yet have a way to intervene in a particular organ type. Um, people are talking about you know, finding some kind of a chemical perhaps, which would allow telomeres to extend the telomeres a little bit more, but that would be in all dividing cells. I don't know yet of a way that you could target that 
to a particular cell type. Okay. And then John asks, um, couldn't telomere length be maintained while simultaneously using a different therapy to kill the cancer cells? In other words, is limiting telomere length the only way to fight cancer? Yeah, there are many, many approaches. Um, and uh, with the revolution in um, sequencing and genomics, um, there is a lot known about, um, on my graph, I showed a little red dot where a cancer cell got a mutation that causes it to divide more times. And so we know a lot about those pathways. This has been really a revolution in um, understanding um, cancer cell growth. And so there are many now targeted therapies which will specifically block those things that are causing the cells to grow more. Telomerase doesn't cause cells to grow more. It just allows them once they have those other changes to be able to divide more times. Okay. And then um, from Marchin, the decay curve for your telomere length versus age in humans seems to have a concave shape, less change in length as you move into old age. Have you noticed that or can you comment on that? Um, yeah, so um, those shapes of the, um, the telogram as we call them um, really have to do with um, the best way to statistically fit the data. So we don't know that there's necessarily a um, a slowing of the rate. It could be um, due to um, there being fewer older people that have shorter telomeres. Uh, so it could be a bias in the data itself. But if we want to look at what the normal distribution is, we have to fit that statistically. And it comes out as this, this curve rather than a straight line. Okay. And then Claire asks, does telomerase and stem cell injections create risk for cancer? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by telomerase and stem cell injections. I know that there are various treatments that people use to, um, uh, for instance, harness their own um, cells and put them back in for treating various um, uh, joint diseases. Um, but I'm not aware of any uh, uh, treatment that puts telomerase back right now. And then Robert wants to know, um, if a mouse embryo is lacking telomerase, like in your G1, G2, and G3 experiments, how does it successfully grow into an adult mouse for your experiment? Right. So um, this is the idea that um, it's only when the telomeres are very short that there's any effect. And in the, the first uh, round of experiments, we were using laboratory mice, which have telomeres that are 10 times longer than human telomeres. So that first generation, there's telomere shortening, and the second generation, there's telomere shortening, and the third generation, there's telomere shortening, but it hasn't reached the critical point yet. It's not until the fifth and sixth generation, and then there are no generations after that. So it does become critical, but it takes a number of generations to get there. Okay. And then David asks, what external factors either increase or decrease the equilibrium telomere length? So you're, you were talking about some of that variation. Is there any evidence that there are external inputs that affect that variation? Um, the, the only external effects that we know right now are um, just more cell division. The more you divide, the, uh, the shorter their tel telomeres are. Um, there are some um, studies uh, that are very interesting in some model organisms um, suggesting that um, if you grow in a, a particular um, environment, um, for instance, if you grow in a, a lot of caffeine, which is a very uh, artificial um, setting, that that can make changes. But this, uh, this isn't something that's been shown actually in humans. Okay. Um, so Charles asks, what genes are expressed, DNA damage repair or autophagy genes, genes when the telomeres get shorter and what chromosomes do they reside on? So are there, is there a correlation between chromosomes that have shorter telomeres that have gone below the threshold and some of the genes that are expressed on those chromosomes? Yeah, there's um, uh... Not a lot known about that right now. What we were able to show um, early on when we studied the mouse that lacks telomerase is that we asked, is there any particular chromosome which gets short first? 
um, we just looked at a whole bunch of different mice and asked which are the chromosomes that lose function first. And what we found was there was no specific chromosome that first gets short. Uh, so for instance, you can imagine like, is it chromosome 17 that gets short and then something happens? And the answer is no, it can be any one of the chromosomes. So um, I don't think that there's a particular role for a specific gene expression. What happens is that the chromosomes get to be short and then they are recognized as DNA damage. So they no longer are protected. They don't have that protective telomere on them. And, um, and that just stops the cell cycle because the cell says, oh, there's DNA damage here. Yeah. And then Bo asks, what's your view or comments on the role of telomeres in non-dividing cells? Um, yeah, the evidence is that there is no um, telomere shortening um, in, in non-dividing cells. And um, we have, have certainly looked at this by taking cells in culture and either letting them grow or letting them sit. And telomeres do not change when you let them sit. And, um, and so you don't undergo this DNA damage response. So right now, what we know about the biology is that only when telomeres are critically short, do they have an effect, which is the DNA damage response. We don't know of anything which is you know, a telomere that's just a little bit shorter than normal. Uh, there's no biological effect of that. And then Kathy asks, is there any connection between tel telomerase function or telomere function in neurodegenerative disease? Um, one of the things about neurodegenerative disease is that uh, typically those are cells that aren't dividing. And so it's, it's very hard to um, think about um, what might happen in the case of non-dividing cells. Uh, that being said, there is some genetic evidence um, in development. Uh, there are some very, very severe cases of extreme telomere shortening uh, where uh, the individuals come to the attention of the doctors when they're in their first year of life. Um, and they have um, severely um, underdeveloped uh, cerebellum. And that might have more to do with the cell divisions in development. Um, so there are some neuronal effects in the very, very severe cases, um, but it's not something that would be an adult neurodegenerative disease. Okay. And then Richard asks, can CRISPR affect telomerase behavior on chromosomes? Um, CRISPR can do all things. Uh, CRISPR <laughs> is uh, the, the tool that we all use for everything. And so we use CRISPR all the time in the lab to be able to generate uh, new ways to look at telomerase. Um, so as a tool, it's, it's a great way for us to study telomerase. I don't know of any direct um, biological um, uh, interaction of CRISPR, of course, because CRISPR comes from, um, from bacterial cells, which have circular chromosomes. Um, so the, um, the main thing that we use for CRISPR is to use it as a fantastic tool. Um, and then Madison asks, can you talk a little bit more about the alternative method for telomere lengthening that you had mentioned earlier? Yeah, um, a number of uh, studies, uh, both in yeast and then also in, uh, in human cells, have shown that um, when the telomeres get to be very short and you don't have telomerase around to be able to elongate them, they do have a salvage pathway um, whereby it's a, um, a, a D DNA recombination where um, a short telomere will invade a long telomere and then you can elongate that. So you start off with a short telomere and a long telomere and you end up with two long telomeres. Um, it's a um, uh, gene conversion for the aficionados uh, kind of a mechanism. And so um, this in, in human cells, they call this ALT for alternative lengthening of telomeres. In yeast where it was discovered by, by Vicki Lundblad, it's called um, survivors, uh, but it's clearly uh, a very important pathway that can occur in cells that don't have telomeres to maintain telomeres. Okay. And then Fred asks a very relevant question right now. Do some viruses affect telomeres? Um, there, there are some studies that have suggested that in certain organisms, viruses will actually sometimes insert into the DNA of telomeres, 
um, and, and that's an interesting mechanism. Uh, this is uh, in um, uh, mosquitoes, I think, and, um, and other uh, um, insects. Uh, so I don't know of any evidence of viruses um, affecting telomeres in human cells. Um, and then Rachel asks, I'm curious about your trajectory as a researcher. Have you always been interested in telomeres or telomerase, or was there a critical moment when you really, when you realized that this would be the focus of your career? Um, yeah, I, um, I started off uh, in graduate school um, working with Liz Blackburn at UC Berkeley, and um, I had the opportunity to start working in telomeres. And um, the interesting thing is that I've continued to work on telomeres, but the questions keep changing. We were working in tetrahymena, trying to identify the enzyme, and then working in yeast, trying to find out uh, what happens with recombination, and then working in human cells and mouse cells. And then we got into the disease, uh, which was just fascinating. So although I've been um, continually working on this particular topic, I think of it kind of like a, a wave, and this is great for Santa Cruz, right? So you're on the water, but the wave underneath you keeps changing if you're surfing. And so the questions, have continued to change over time, but I've always been writing on the telomere and answering different questions uh, while writing on that telomere. And that's a great metaphor. So um, one from Nelia, what, where is the seed in your background? Uh, the seed in my background is the Trinity Alps. Uh, I went backpacking there uh, this summer that was taken this summer in June. Okay. Um, and then Jonathan asks, you talked about mice and protozoa, but what about telomeres in plants and other organisms? Can you make the same generalizations that you've made in mice and tetrahymena? Yeah, there's a, a very large literature that um, plants, all of those trees back there, also have the same mechanisms of uh, telomere length maintenance. The telomerase is there um, and um, they have telomere shortening if you don't have telomerase. Uh, the one exception is, um, uh, some, some species of fly, so a uh, model organism called Drosophila and, um, and some other uh, related uh, dipteran insects, uh, they seem to have lost this telomerase and um, they use transposable elements um, instead, which is another um, fascinating little branch off of the, off of the tree. Um, and then David asks, are there any sex-related differences in telomere length? Um, there are not major sex related differences when you look at that normal distribution in the human population. Um, there are certainly um, some differences in terms of when we look at our telomerase knockout mice, because um, of course the number of cell divisions that occur in the male germline, it's about from a, a mouse when it um, is a, an embryo till when it um, has mature sperm, it's about 62 cell divisions, whereas on the female side, it's about 15. So, um, so there are rates of shortening that happen just due to the number of cell divisions. Okay. Um, and then Joseph, wa Joseph wants to know, is telomerase active during a specific time in the cell cycle? Um, and the answer to this is different in different, um, in different organisms. Uh, we uh, certainly studied um, using uh, human blood cells. And if you just take human blood cells directly from a person and measure telomerase, it's undetectable. But if you take those blood cells and stimulate them so they start dividing, then you have enzyme activity. So when the cell is just um, resting in its resting state, as most blood cells are, you don't detect enzyme activity. But once you kick it into the cell cycle, then you can see activity. Okay. And then this will be our last question. Um, what are you wondering about now? I'm wondering about how it is that the cell knows how much to add on to the end of the chromosome. That question about um, you have the telomerase enzyme here and you have the telomere and there's something that regulates how much in any given cell cycle gets added to be able to establish that equilibrium length. We know the equilibrium length is critically important because you have cancer on the one hand or degenerative disease on the other hand, but we don't really know what it is that establishes that equilibrium length. And that's what we really want to find out. Okay, thank you so much, Kara. Thank you. I think 
Is there, I, do we have time for one more question? Um, so one last question that I'm just gonna ask, um, and then I'll turn it over to George, is um, what advice do you have for young female scientists who are starting out in their research careers? Uh, enjoy what you do and um, find allies that can help you to be able to realize your dreams because um, it's really been a privilege to be able to um, do science and just be able to follow my curiosity. Um, and um, I was able to do that because I had people along the way that would be able to um, help me realize those things. And, um, and um, it really, it, it takes a village. So reach out and, um, and uh, ask for help from your peers, uh, your teachers, uh, it's, it's a fun thing to do, to be able to your curiosity. So it's definitely worth it. Thank you so much, Carol. I think you're mute, George. Thank you, Chesley Reeve, Carol, and Needy for joining us tonight. Carol, it is quite exciting to have you as our first Nobel Prize laureate here at UC Santa Cruz and another step in fulfilling the promise of this remarkable institution. I really enjoyed your talk. Please join us January 27th, 2021 for our next Kral Lecture with distinguished Professor Dan Costa and Professor Slavik Tulasi as they examine the effects of climate change in Antarctica. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone, and stay safe.